Before we begin, uh, it's about 25 to 8. I want to let you go before 8.30. Do three things for me, and they're very simple. Number one, please turn off all your cell phones. We don't want any disturbance as we worship God. Uh, favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me. And simply say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And that's based on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I should tell you, my words have no power. God's words have power. Can you say amen? amen. So I want his words in my mouth. I am just his spokesperson. I am not God. And favor number three, I want you to think as you listen. Think, reason honestly, and see what God does. Let's bow our heads and pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you, Father, for bringing us to this place to listen to your word. As the word is spoken, I ask you to grant us your spirit, who is the spirit of truth, that he may guide our minds into truth, dear God. Speak through me. I humble myself in your presence. I seek no glory for me, but glory for you and a blessing for your people. A special blessing on our visitor and those who are on their way. Bring them safely, we pray. And at the end of this meeting, let us say it was good to have been here. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say amen and amen. Our subject for this evening, the law of life. What did I say? The law of life. Go with me to Matthew chapter 23. There's something I want to establish first. Matthew 23. Let's read verse 37 of Matthew chapter 23. You know, before Matthew met Christ, what was he? He was a tax collector. Give me another word for tax collector back then. He was a publican. Give me another word. He was a thief. <laughs> With all respect to Matthew, he was a crook. But when he met Christ, Christ changed his life. And he went from being a thief, a dishonest public official, to writing the first gospel of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, before he was the Apostle Paul, what was he? A murderer. He would arrange to have the Christians killed. When he met Christ, Christ changed him so profoundly. Instead of killing people, he offered his life. For the very movement he tried to destroy. I am saying that to say to you that Christ has the power to change your life so drastically that people will not recognize you. Matthew 23, reading verse 37. It's a familiar verse. The Bible says, and this is Jesus Christ speaking, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Notice how Jesus calls Jerusalem. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He calls twice. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. We shall read verse 41 of Luke chapter 10, reading verse 41. It's a very familiar story. Jesus is in the house of Mary and Martha. And Martha comes and complains, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And in verse 41, the Bible says, And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken from her. So Jesus calls Martha twice. Martha, Martha. Let's stay in the book of Luke. Go to chapter 22. We shall read verse 31. Luke 22, reading verse 31. Our subject is the law of life. You have chapter 22 of Luke, third, uh, chapter verse 31 of Luke chapter 22. Then the Lord said, what? Simon, Simon, Satan have desired to have thee, that he might sift thee as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Jesus called Simon, Simon, Simon. And so he looked at Jerusalem, and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He looked at Martha, he said, Oh, Martha, Martha. He spoke to Simon, he said, Simon, Simon. Let's go to a Mark chapter 15. We'll read verse 34. Mark 15, reading verse 34. And I'm grateful that we're starting on time tonight. 
Maybe one night I'll show you how God is absolutely always on time. God is not late. And those of us who call himself, ourselves our children, who were made in his image, should do everything in our power not to be late. What book did I say? Mark. What chapter? 15. What verse? 34. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God. And so we have Jerusalem, Jerusalem. We have Martha, Martha. We have Simon, Simon. We have my God, my God. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. In this chapter, we have the record of Paul persecuting the early Christians. And verse 3 of Acts chapter 9 says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, What? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And when Saul said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. So we have five instances in the New Testament of the style of Jesus' call. Did you hear what I just said? The style. Christ had a way of calling you twice. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Martha, Martha. Simon, Simon. Uh, my God, my God. Saul, Saul. Let's go to Genesis chapter 22. Let's skip to the Old Testament now. Genesis 22. In this chapter, God instructs Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And in verse 9 of Genesis 22, the Bible says, And he came to the place which God had told him of, and built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, verse 10 of Genesis 22, and took the knife to slay his son. Read verse 11 with me, nice and loud. And the angel of the Lord did what? Called unto him out of heaven and said what? Abraham, Abraham. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. We'll read from verse 1 of Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said what? Moses, Moses. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. In this chapter, God calls the little boy Samuel. He wants to tell Samuel that he has chosen him to succeed Eli as the high priest. Now, God calls Samuel in verse 4, in verse 6, and verse 8. But verse 10 is our key verse of 1 Samuel chapter 3. Do you have that? All right, 1 Samuel chapter 3, reading verse 10. Do we have that? All right. The Bible says, And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. And how did he call? Samuel, Samuel. Now, the Bible is not a book of proof, it's a book of evidence. That's why I ask you at the beginning to reason honestly. What is the evidence telling us as we look at how Christ called in the New Testament and how this person is calling in the Old Testament, what is the evidence suggesting? Same person. A lot of Christians don't believe that. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10, we shall read from verse 1. Do you have 1 Corinthians 10? We read from verse 1. We're reading from the King James Version. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they all eat the same spiritual meat. And they all drink the same spiritual drink. 
finish that verse with me now. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. Finish the verse. And that rock was Christ. The God that led the Israelites through the wilderness was Christ. Amen. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We shall read from verse 9. Our subject is the law of life, and I'm taking considerable time to establish this reasonable point that the Christ of the New Testament is the God of the Old. Do you have 1 Peter chapter 1? Reading verse 9, and it says what? Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Verse 11, searching what? Or what manner of time? Finish the verse with me now. The Spirit of Christ, which was in them. Now, which prophets is Peter referring to? Name a few of them. Come on, name a few. All right, David was a prophet. Name another one. Moses was a prophet. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel, Samuel was a prophet. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, all the Old Testament prophets. The Bible says the spirit that inspired them was the spirit of whom? The spirit of Christ. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. We should read from verse 24. Our subject is the law of life. Hebrews 11, reading from verse 24. Do you have Hebrews? Amen. You have chapter 11, Amen. verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming what? Come on, read loudly. Esteeming what? The reproach of whom? Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. In the Old Testament, Moses understood that by taking sides with the Israelites, he would receive the reproach of Christ. He would suffer for Christ. <laughs> we have looked at many texts. The evidence suggests, let me speak in scientific scholarly terms, the evidence suggests you know, when you read scientific papers, they always suggest. They very seldom say anything categorically. We did a study, a meta-analysis of this or that, and the results suggest. <laughs> well, why can't the Bible suggest? What we have seen tonight suggests, rather convincingly, that the God of the new is the God of the old. Now listen to Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. We read it this morning. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let's read verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Keep in mind, Genesis 1 verse 3, And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Have you found it? Read with me. For God who did what? Commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. Now, that verse does not identify the person just as God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. We need to identify who that person was. Let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, We're reading from verse 1. Our subject is the law of life. John 1, reading from verse 1. Very familiar passage. Do you have it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Pause. That verse tells us many things. Whenever the beginning was, as far as we're concerned, because God has no beginning, was the Word. As far back as we can go, the Word was with God. And as far back as we can go, the Word was God. What does that verse tell us? It tells us there's plurality. There's the Word and there's God, two distinct personalities. It also tells us the Word was God, meaning equality. Are you with me? 
We have plurality. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That's plurality, Word and God. The Word was God. That's equality. The same was in the beginning with God. It's repeated, the plurality. Verse 3, all things were made by Him, not them. In verse 1, we have plurality. In verse 2, we have plurality. In verse 3, we have singularity. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Look at verse 10. Read nice and loud. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, not them. And the world knew him not. Now look at verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Which member of the Godhead was made flesh? Jesus Christ. Now, he's called the Word. Now, let's go back to verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. That's Christ. The Word was with God. The Word was God, equating Christ with God. The same was in the beginning, the same Word with God. All things were made by Him, this Word. And without Him, hmm? without Him, was not anything made. You remove Christ from the equation and nothing exists. Without him was not anything made that was made. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. We'll read from verse 16. Colossians 1, reading from verse 16. And I may have to split this message into two parts. Because I'm taking a long time to establish that the God of the Old Testament is Christ. We're now establishing the Creator was Christ. Colossians 1, reading from verse 16, the Bible says, For by Him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him. What are the next few words? And for Him. And He is before all things and by Him. All things consist, or as some versions say, hold together. Now, who is this him? Let's look at verse 14 to get a clue. What does verse 14 say? In whom we have what? Redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, who shed his blood? It was Jesus Christ. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. We'll read from verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 1. Our subject is what? The law of life. Under the umbrella of God has answers. You have Hebrews 1. Reading from verse 1, the Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us how? By his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Read verse 3 with me. Who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. We learn something in Hebrews 1.3, which we discovered in Colossians 1.17, that the person who created is also the person who upholds, and maintains, and sustains. And who is that person according to the Bible? It is Christ. Now listen to the Bible again, Genesis 1, 3. And God said, Who was that who said, Let there be light? It was Christ. There was a storm in Mark chapter 10. And Jesus was asleep in the boat. The disciples woke him and said, Master, kill us thou not that we perish. And he awoke and rebuked the wind said to the sea, be still, and the wind ceased. There was a great calm. And, he, and Jesus rebuked them for their lack of faith. And in verse, the last verse of that, Mark chapter 10, listen to these words. And they feared exceedingly. The disciples were so scared when they saw what Jesus did. And said one to another, what manner of man is this? Finish the verse with me. That even the wind and the sea do what? Now, I'm sure you've read that before, and you just passed over it. The Bible says, the wind and the sea obey Christ. Now, don't waste your time asking me how that happens. 
I don't know. All I know is when he rebuked the wind, the wind died down. When he said to the sea, peace be still, there was a great calm. And those men saw it. And they were amazed to the point of terror that one man in human flesh could have so much power. Even the wind and the sea obey him. Go to Second Chronicles chapter 7, reading from verse 13. Second Chronicles 7, reading from verse 13, our subject is the law of life. Second Chronicles 7, reading verse 13. Do you have it? If you're still trying to find it, you say amen. Okay, come on, find it, find it, find it. <laughs> you're a child of God. You must be quick around God's word. Do you have it now? Second Chronicles 7, reading verse 13, do you have it? Listen to what God says. Read with me. If I shut heaven that there be no what? Rain. We'll come back to find out how God shut heaven that there be no rain. Or if I do what? command the locusts to do what? Devour the land. <laughs> Didn't God command some birds to feed Elijah? You know who that God was? Christ. And the ravens obeyed him. And so the God of the Old Testament we identified of Christ, he said, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, now, how does God shut up heaven that there be no rain? Go to Isaiah chapter 5. Let's read verse 6. Isaiah 5, reading verse 6. Read the last statement of verse 6. And I will do what? Command what? The clouds that what? There rain no rain upon it. Referring to the vineyard, which is a symbol of Israel. I will command the clouds that there rain no rain. Only the creator can do that. Now, having established that Christ is creator according to the Bible, and he's the God of the Old Testament, let's go back to Genesis 1.3. You know the verse? And God said what? Let there be light, and there was light. Now we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. When Christ said, Let there be light. Listen to me carefully. That statement, let there be light. What was it? Let me ask you this way. When he said, let there be light, did he mean light? If you're present anywhere, please come. Is that what he meant? Light, if it's okay with you, show up. It was a command. Now, this is extremely important. These words, let there be light, was a command. And that is verified in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. When Christ said, let there be light, that was a command. When he said, let there be a firmament, that was a command. When he said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, that was a command. Go to Psalm 33. Let's read verses 6 and 9. Psalm 33, 6 and 9. Those of you who had a hard time finding 2 Chronicles, please put a smile on my face by finding Psalm very quickly. <laughs> Have you found it? <laughs> All right. I don't know who said amen, but okay. Do you have Psalm 33? Verses 6 and 9, read with me. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Verse 9, for he spake, and it was done. Read the last part of that verse. He commanded, and it stood fast. By command. Let's go to Psalm 148. Reading verses 1, 2, and 3. 1, 2, and 5. Psalm 148, 1, 2, and 5. Do you have that? Amen. Praise ye the Lord. Read with me. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him 
in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Verse 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord. Finish the verse. For he commanded and they were created. We have another verse. That creation was by command. Go to Isaiah 45. Read verse 12. Isaiah 45, yes, reading verse 12. Do you have it? This side, my right side. You have the King James Version? Read that verse for us. I, I have done what? Made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hand, have done what? Stretched out the heavens and all the hosts finish it. Have I commanded? The host can refer to the stars or the heavenly beings that exist in heaven. All their hosts have I commanded. We have Isaiah 45, 12, Psalm 33, 9, Psalm 146, verse uh, 5, and 2 Chronicles, Corinthians 4, verse 6. Creation by command. Is that clear? All right. Listen to Hebrews 1, verse 3. Just listen. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things. How many things? All things by the word of his power. Now to uphold is different from create. You create first, then you uphold that which is created. Give me another word for uphold. Sustain. Listen to Colossians 1.17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, or are carried or held together, or are carried along. Creation and maintenance by the same person. Are you following me? Now this is very important. There's a, I think it's called a deism. I think it's deism or theism, one or the other. The belief is God created the heavens and the universe, but left it to run itself. William Miller used to be part of that. I think it's a deists. But the Bible says something different. The Bible says, he is before all things and by him all things consist. The Bible says in Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. holding all things. Now, if you read Colossians 1, 7, 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So he creates all things, and he maintains all things. Can you say amen? The same person. Now, let me introduce something else. He creates by his word, the word of power. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. Listen. For this, now you go there. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Skip to verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now by that same word are kept in store. Very clear. The same word that creates is the same word that preserves. Is that clear? The same person who creates is the same person who maintains. Listen to this. There are several lessons in that for us. Lesson one. The level of excellence 
at which creation was made is the same level of excellence at which God wants it maintained. Ah, you missed it. I heard two and a half amens. <laughs> you missed it. Let me say it again. Let's say someone built this, well, someone did build this building, maybe 15 years ago. It is not at the same level of pristine beauty as it was when it was first made. Are you with me? It has depreciated. God's creation does not depreciate. That was his original will. The same power that made it is the power that what? Maintains it, which means the level of excellence at which it was made is the level of excellence at which it must be preserved. God understands no drop in excellence. Are you with me? Now you apply the spiritual lesson. The power by which we are saved is the power by which we grow. Are you with me? No angel could maintain creation because no angel created. The Bible is clear. The one who created is the one who maintains. The angel Gabriel, according to scripture, the highest angel in heaven, could not maintain creation. Only God the, God the Son who created can maintain. But let's go back to what we said. We've discovered that the word that creates is the word that sustains or maintains. All right. We also discovered that that word, let there be light, was what? A command. Now, if the word that creates is a command, and it's the same word that maintains, creation was by what? Preserving creation is by what? Command. And who did it? Christ. Now here's, don't sleep, follow me. The entire creation was by command. And is maintained by command. And a small word for command is a law. Are you following me? Who set up that system? Christ. Don't hesitate. Say it. All right. Now let's look at the order of creation. On day one, what did Christ make? The light. Day two, the firmament. Day three, uh, grass, trees. Day four, sun, moon, stars. Day five, fish and birds. Day six, land animals. The last work of creation was what? Humanity. Here's what happened. Adam opened his eyes and Eve opened her eyes and found themselves in a universe created by what? Created by, I don't say by whom, by what? And preserved by what? Command. Then how were they to fit into that system? By living in obedience to command. Now, if God had made Adam first, Adam might have wanted creation made to suit him. Are you with me? But because he was made last, he opened his eyes and found the system already in place. Everything is run by law. Adam, you fit in. And so we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. That was a command. And if Adam had obeyed, you and I would have wings today. We would be taller than we are. We won't need... Uh, Cough medicine and Botox. <laughs> are you with me? We are in our condition because a command was violated. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 48, paragraph 1. Hearken to these words. 
everything in nature, from the moat in the sunbeam. Do you know what a moat in a sunbeam is? Next time you open your window and the sunlight comes streaming in, just kick your carpet. You'll see a lot of little things floating in that sunbeam. That's a, each one is a moat. Listen again. Everything in nature, from the moat in the sunbeam to worlds on high, is under law. Let me put it this way for you scientists. I threaten to make this... The universe was made by command. What's the universe made of? Give me one word. Use matter. Follow me closely. The universe is made up of matter. And matter is generally broken down into how many? Solid, liquids, gas. Are solids, do solids behave according to certain laws, yes or no? Yes. Do liquids behave according to certain laws? Yes. Do gases behave according to laws? Yes. Which means all of matter behaves according to law. And I use the word behave deliberately. Matter behaves. Scientists observe the behavior. Now, if you pour water into a bottle let's say gas into a bottle how does the gas behave in that container it fills up the entire container and takes on the shape completely of that container that's how a gas behaves now if you pour water into that container it takes the shape of that portion of the container that it occupies are you with me that's how liquid behaves if you put a solid it does not take the shape of the container at all and yet, it is ice, vapor, and water. Same chemical thing, no change. But as the state changes, the behavior changes according to law. Now listen to me. All of matter is under law. That's the whole universe. You are solid, liquid, and gas. Well, you don't believe me? Let me, let me inform you that you are. Do you have bones? That's one right there. Solid. Do you have liquid in you? Yes. Blood, lymphatic fluid? Yes. Do we have gas in us? Yes. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, and whatever else comes in when we breathe, some nitrogen, some whatever else. We, without that gas, we couldn't live. We are solid, liquid, and gas. You know why divers get the bends when they come up too quickly? Because the gas does what? Expands. Gas behaves. Liquids behave. Solids behave. And there are laws to guide their behavior. No scientist will argue against that. But when God made man, he said, let us make man in our image. Now, image is character. And character is not solid, liquid, nor gas. But it has to behave. <laughs> Are you following me? It has to behave. There must be laws to govern the behavior of character. And that law is called the Ten Commandments. 
Not Newton's three laws, not Boyle's laws for gases, not Bernoulli's laws. Mm -mm. God's laws, the Ten Commandments, they control the behavior of the character because character is neither solid, liquid, nor gas, but it is real. What am I trying to say, the law of life? The creator, Christ. Now, some churches say when Christ died, he did away with law. <laughs> That's like saying he did away with the universe. Are you with me? You do away with the law, nothing exists. You know why you're not going through that pew as you sit there? You know there's a force pushing back as you push down with your body weight? There's a force pushing back. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be able to prove it. There's a force pushing back. My brothers and sisters, our theme is God has answers. Answers to what? If there had been no sin, what questions would we ask God? Hmm? If we had obeyed God, what questions would we have? But as you listen to the theme, God has answers. Answers to what questions? Why am I suffering? Why am I always broke? How come I'm on my third marriage? You know, why, why are my children in the world? Those are the questions we have. And they all go back to one source. Sin. Which is the violation of law. Every answer God will supply to you takes you and me right back to living in harmony with the system he set up. And when we do that, our problems begin to diminish. Law is life. I'll ask you a question, don't answer me. Are you living in harmony with God's law? Don't answer me. The thing about God, God does not believe in ambushing people. God comes right in the open. For instance, let's take uh, Exodus 15, 26. Go there with me. I'll let you out in 10 minutes. Exodus 15, 26. Let's go there. See how God functions. That's why God cannot be blamed for any problems we have. And a slight degree of decency will lead us to conclude it's our problem. Do you have Exodus 15, verse 26? And said, if thou wilt do what? Diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. And will do that which is? In whose sight? Not your, the sight of your friends. Listen to me, as Christians, we must do what's right in God's sight. Not the sight of society. Not the sight of your professional organization. We must do what is right in God's sight. And to do that, we must understand what God's sight is. And to know that, we must study his word. You're not listening to me. That is living by faith. Seeing the world through God's eyes. So if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight. What's the next statement? And will do what? Give ear to all his commandments and keep all his statutes. What does he promise to do? I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. Conclude the verse now. I am the Lord that he lift thee on what condition? One word, obedience. Now that's what Brother Ben will be trying to push every night. Their laws. They govern our physical being, our mental being, our spiritual being. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. Most of us, we hearken casually. Because we say, ah, God is not that kind of God. You know, we all have our personal gods. Oh, my God doesn't mind. My God is not that narrow-minded. My God can't be upset if two men love each other and they live together in a homosexual relationship and they're monogamous. My God has no problem. My God, we all have our gods. 
If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight. Forget your sight. God's sight. And will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none. <laughs> Did you hear what the Bible said? None. Now, we don't do what he says. And then we get diseases, and then we blame God. He's a God of sickness. He's a God of misery. And God says, look, <laughs> let me give you an assignment to do. When you go home tonight, or sometime before tomorrow, read Deuteronomy chapter 28, and Deuteronomy chapter 7, and see all the... For Deuteronomy chapter 28, from verse 1 to about verse 14, and read the whole chapter of Deuteronomy 7. See what God has promised to do if we would do one thing. What's that? Obey him. Yes, God has answers. And he has one answer for all our problems. What's that answer? <laughs> Obey me. <laughs> the Bible is so embarrassingly simple. Just do what I say. But we're so bright, we have to deconstruct <laughs> and, uh, all kinds of rubbish. And God makes it so simple. Listen to what God said to Adam in Genesis 3 verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. What is God saying? Because you did what I told you not to do. Wherever I go, I preach this, the concept of obedience. And it irks a lot of people. <laughs> it upsets a lot of people. Because the carnal nature hates obedience. Listen to what the Bible says. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. And so obedience upsets people. They hate it. Even Christians. Many Christians have a limited tolerance for spirituality. Very limited. Don't tell me to have a Bible study on Saturday night. I waited 24 hours for the sun to set. What nonsense are you telling me a Bible study? This is breakout time. <laughs> Bible study on Saturday night? We have a limited tolerance for spiritual things. And a vast tolerance for the things of this world. When things go wrong, we don't go to the world for help. We go right to God. And God says, I, I don't know you. You look familiar, but I, I don't know you. You know, God will say that in the judgment. Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And God, Jesus, God will say to them, I, I, I don't know you. Depart from me. My brothers and sisters, let me give you one quotation and close. Christ Object Lessons, page 283, paragraph 3. There are only two classes in the world today, and only two classes will be recognized in the judgment. Those who violate God's law, and those who obey. When you obey God, you are in harmony with the pulse of the universe. It was made by command, preserved by command. When you and I violate God's law, we put ourselves out of harmony and threaten the system Christ set up. That's what sin does. It threatens to undermine the universal system of order that Christ established. Because for there to be order, there must be law. And as you come, I'll tell you how that law can be kept very easily. There's a surgical procedure that Christ does to make it very easy and delightful to keep his law. But for tonight, I want you to think, is there any aspect of my life out of harmony with God's system of law, which is for everything animate and inanimate? And if there's an area of your life or mine out of harmony with law, by the grace of God, bring that area into harmony. The sooner, the better. 
Sickness is the result of the violation of the laws of health. And they all come from the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. If we would just obey God, ah, the blessings that would come to us, we would not have room enough to receive them. And when God blesses you as a faithful person, he blesses you so torrentially, like the monsoons of Southeast Asia, that the blessings splash on people next to you. And so the Bible says, God blessed Potiphar for Joseph's sake. Huh? God was blessing Joseph, and it splashed all over Potiphar. What did Laban say to Jacob when Jacob returned to his homeland? Jacob's, Laban said, I have learned by experience that God has blessed me for your sake. When you and I obey God, his blessings that he gives to us are so vast that those in our circle are blessed. Now, you reverse that when we don't obey. Then we become a curse, not a blessing. The law of life is the law of obedience. How many of you will say with me, Father, help me to live in harmony with the universal system of law that Christ set up. Can I see your right hand? God bless you. Stand up. Let's pray and let's go. Come back tomorrow night. Come on time, please. And listen to the message God has prepared for you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. It is sweet. It is simple to understand, dear God, if we will listen with honest hearts, if we will reason. Father in heaven, help us to understand that you set up a system through Christ. It's a system based on law. It is a foundation of happiness at every level of creation. And for those of us, dear God, who are living our lives outside of that system, give us the wisdom, Father, by your abiding power to bring our lives into harmony with the system Christ set up, the system of law being the foundation of life. Please, God, forgive us for our spiritual lapses. Forgive us for our oft disobedience. And give us a heart that loves to do what is right in your sight. Bless every family represented in this congregation as we disperse to our homes, dear Father. Take us safely. Protect us from harm and danger. Bring us back tomorrow. Again, a special blessing on our visitors. Bring them back to hear your word again. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say amen and amen. God bless you. Travel safely. Keep the speed limit. That's a law. And come back tomorrow night to listen